Hello, hello. How's, How's it going? going on? Hey, Justin. It's going all right. It's a little uh, hard to hear you, maybe. Uh, let me try. try. All, all, all right. right. Better, better. better. Uh, not really. There's a lot. Not really. really. Oh, oh, perfect. perfect. Um, shoot. All right, all right. I'm trying to mess around with the settings, settings a little, little bit. bit. I don't, I don't know, know if it's making it better, better or worse. worse. Um, I don't think it made a difference. Okay, okay. You sound kind of uh, kind of scary, like a like a. <laughs> Okay, do I sound any better now? You sound perfect. Okay, great. I just switched to my laptop. Um, hey, I had a question regarding these uh, these new lectures. Are they going to mm -hmm. be recorded? Yes, I'm recording it right now. Mm -hmm. cool. cool. Yeah, That's awesome. yeah, I was going to mention this. So, um, um, yeah, I mean, I'm going to record them and post them. But uh, I guess just be aware, I guess, what you say if you... Don't don't flash your entire solution for the assignment. Right. So everybody can see it. Yeah. I mean, um, you know, it's gonna make my grading real easy. Yeah. Um, everyone gets a hundred. No. Um, I like that. Yeah, just kind of. Yeah. <laughs> cool. All right. Well, that's good to hear. Thank you. Yep. All right, cool. Uh, so we can get started. Thank you all for joining. Uh, I want to say thank you for the feedback of uh, um, letting me know that you strongly prefer um, live lectures. I think that's actually um, a good idea because I definitely saw you guys getting a little bit lost on um, on this first assignment. And um, I, I can uh, usually a little bit tell a little bit better in the classroom, kind of how you guys are struggling and get you guys to ask questions. I think um, I didn't have too many of you ask questions in, in uh, um, office hours. I think that was a little bit of an issue with availability. Um, so anyway, we need to, we need to fix this. Um, I need to fix this. So um, I like these assignments to be challenging. I think you guys get to learn a lot through solving the problems, but I definitely don't want you guys to be stuck. So um, I think, the previous model just didn't give you guys enough opportunities um, to ask questions. So, um, yeah, so it's good to address it and um, want to make sure you guys kind of benefit from these assignments as previous classes did and um, not, not make it kind of the worst class that you're taking right now in terms of being just an, an absurd amount of work because it really doesn't need to be. So anyway, that's um, my thing. 
Um, and I think with that, um, I have a kind of a new lecture ready, so maybe we'll get to it. Um, but what I want to make sure is that you guys are um, good for the next assignment. I think the assignments are really important, and um, I want to make sure that no one's kind of getting lost, getting left behind, that there's some questions that are unanswered about what the assignment is, how to approach it. Um, since I kind of defined it online, I mean, you guys have all that, but it didn't really give you the opportunity to ask questions. Um, so while I have you all here, um, let's maybe talk about this, the next assignment a little bit, make sure everyone is on board. And then if you guys end up with kind of questions of, I'm stuck, how do I do this? Um, you know, post stuff to technical help, um, come to my office hours and we can talk like one-on-one -on -one as far as what's going on in your particular code. Um, so I hope that sounds okay to you guys. That sounds great. Great. Thanks for the feedback. Um, all right. So um, let me pop open the assignment. I guess I have it um, up here. And I will share my screen at some point. Okay. Uh, let's go to the sort of browser. Okay. All right, cool. Um, so this is the assignment under RDT, um, the RDT branch. Hope you guys found it already. And so um, basically what you guys are doing is implementing a transmission going back and forth. Here we, here we just have arrows going in one direction, um, but they're really going back and forth. Uh, data going from the application layer to the transport layer to the network layer. Now the network layer transmits data to the other network layer instance running on um, kind of another process stack or another machine, and then back to reliable data transfer and then back to the server, and then there's a reverse flow as well. So as we send data from client to RDT, we send data to, we pass data to RDT 1.0, that's uh, RDT 1.0 send. RDT will then use the UDT send function to pass the data. Yep, hello? Uh, is there a question? Uh, sorry, I can't understand the question. I think the sound is a little garbled. Maybe try it in chat. Okay, I'll just go on for now. Um, and then, so anyway, with passing it to UDT send, network will pass it to UDT receive. Um, and then in RDT PY, we're going to call RDT 1.0 receive to pass it to the application layer. Um, so that's the general flow. Now, what you guys are supposed to do, or what I'm asking you to do, is to implement functions for RDT 2.1, which we discussed in the slides, and then RDT 3.0, um, which we touched upon in the slides. Okay? So... Um, can you guys see the RDT slides that it switch over? Oh. Okay, great. Very good. Yeah, I can see. Um, good, thanks. Um, so um, RDT 2.1 is this protocol, which we talked about in fair amount of detail, or I talked about it in a fair amount of detail. And then RDT 3.0 is this protocol, which um, also allows for packets to be lost. And then you need to kind of extend RDT um, 2.1, this model, basically to looks like something like this, um, which is covered in your book in more detail. So like RDT 2.1 is easier, and we talked about it in more detail. This one, you have to read the book and research a little bit more, um, but it's not that much of a leap from, uh, from 2.1. So that's kind of how the assignment is staggered. All right, so um, any questions at this point? I can. I want to kind of get into the code to, to show you guys where things need to happen. Um, but are there any general questions at this point? All right, I'll take that as a no. Um, all right, so let me see. I need to share something else. Um, Uh, 
So. Okay. So. Okay. So this is so this is the code. Uh, this is your assignment. And if you if you run it, um, basically you start the server, and then we're going to start the client. And you'll see that the client is whatever sending this text to the server, and then the server is replying with that converted to Twig Latin. Right? And there's kind of a number of these packets going forward. Um, so we have the implementation for client, which basically loops through these things and send them, sends them to the server. We have the implementation for the server, which can convert things to Twig Latin and then um, send them back. So with so the server receives data through RDT 1.0 receive, and then it uses um, RDT 1.0 send to reply back to the client. Um, now, most of the magic happens in RDT, and there's some magic that happens in, in network. So the network part, for now, you guys don't need to worry about it. There's a TCP socket being established to kind of forward data between uh, the client and the server. Um, I'm using a TCP connection just to have some connection. I could use UDP. It makes it a little bit easier with TCP. I could be using file communications. I could be using a bunch of other things. It doesn't matter that it uses TCP. It's just a, it's just a channel. Um, but anyway, networks thing, talk to each other. The only thing you will need to change here eventually is things like probability of packet loss, probability of byte corruption, and packet reorder if you guys are doing, um, if you guys are doing the, um, the bonus assignment. So let's say that we change this from 0 to something like 0 0.5, which is a lot. You probably want to actually have something smaller, like maybe 0 0.2 or 0 0.1. Um, right? So when we run this thing again, Not enough of a, not enough of a loss. Try this again. There you go. Okay. Now we got problems, right? So, um, basically, bad things happen. So we're trying to send this. It doesn't work. We're trying to send this. It runs into all kinds of problems. So um, things will kind of break. For you in some number of ways, um, depending kind of where the error happens. Um, so basically, if it doesn't run, it could be that all these things just print out. It could be that your Python quits. Right? That's because you're basically not handling packet loss. Um, and depending on if the packet is lost, if 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 a packet is going forward or, or going back, um, you can get different errors. So what you need to do is um, basically implement um, a protocol that can deal with packets being lost by allowing them to be retransmitted, right? And so what you need to do is we have kind of RDT 1.0 sent and RDT 1.0 receive that are these vanilla functions that just rely on basically a, a reliable network. And then you guys can implement your functions here. Um, and then when you do implement them, you can change what happens in the client in that it doesn't use 1.0, it uses 2.1 uh, functions here. And here, same thing on the server, so you can switch onto your RDT 2.1 and then 3.0 code. Um, what else? What else do I want to tell you about this? I guess an important thing is up here um, in this packet class. So what we have is a packet that is being sent back and forth. And that packet, so that's just a class, just an object. And then to send it over the actual network, you need to convert it to bytes. Right? So from the network perspective, all, all we're doing is we're sending bytes back and forth. So you can take a packet class, an object, and you can convert it to a byte string. So I use this Hungarian notation where I'm kind of including sub s to, to indicate things that are actually strings in Python. Um, I think sub s is the only thing I use. There's some other things maybe later on you'll see. Um, this is basically just a naming thing to kind of remind me that here I'm looking for a string. Okay. So I can take a byte packet, apply the get byte string function, and then what I'm going to get in return is a string that represents that packet. Now I can take that string and I can pass it to from byte s, and that's going to take that string and convert it back to a packet. So this return self is basically calling a constructor, constructor being this, okay, to create a packet based on a sequence number and message 
string which I've extracted from this string that I passed in here. Okay. Questions about this? All right, so far so good. Great. Um, something comes up, just chat me or, or whatever. Um, and so when you guys are implementing this, for example, this is kind of the, the first like hint how to unlock this problem. Um, to do RDT 2.1, you need to include acknowledgments, right? You need to, to include checksums, you need to include acknowledgments. So the way to do this is to basically add a field to the packet that includes checksums and um, acknowledgments, right? Or can, can, can make a packet and acknowledgement, right? Now, if you're adding um, variables to this class, when you create a byte string, you also need to serialize those variables. Okay? So the way we're serializing a variable here is we're saying, for example, for the sequence number, okay, we're going to convert that integer to a string, okay, and then we're going to fill fill the string up to the sequence number string length, which I'm defining here. So in the string that I create, in the packet string that I create, the first 10 characters are going to represent the sequence number. So what you'll see is going to be something like 0, 0, 0, 1, right? Um, and so when you guys are adding fields, you also need to define how long these fields are, okay? Um, and then you also need to define um, how they are being serialized here and in what order and how they're going to be, de so, sorry, how they're being, de how they are being serialized in this function and how they are being deserialized in this function back to a packet. Okay? So once you kind of extend the packets with the fields that you need for the protocol, then you can go down here and implement the functions of these, of these protocols. Now, the way to implement these functions is to go back to, um, let's see if I can switch my sharing to the browser. Great, can you guys see my browser? It looks okay. like it's loading right now. Not yet. How about now? Those are going to be the slides there, it looks like. Is that what yes. we're looking for? Okay. Thank you. Yep, thank you. So the way you implement those functions inside those functions is, for example, for RDT send, you need to implement this. Um, you need to implement this protocol, right? So what is going to make your job sane is that inside, these, inside the function, when the function is called, it can start in one of these four states, okay? So the first thing you figure out is, is you have some switch statement or like an if then else statement, right? That determines which state you're in, okay? And what you can do is you can, you know, whenever you exit a state, right? Let's call this states zero, one, two, and three, right? I mean, they have names, so you can name them, you know? Um, so when you are done with this state, you're in state one. And now when this function is called, you have to be in state one. So the first thing you can do is just do a switch being like, what state did I leave in? I left in state one, so that's the state I'm coming back in. And then inside that if statement that handles this uh, state, you can do two things. You can either do this, this loop, or you can do that transition, okay? So if you organize your functions to basically only do, figure out what state you're in when the function's being invoked, um, and then do the things only in the state, and then either go back to the same state or transition to the new state, um, your job becomes pretty easy, right? When you try to implement this without using the state transitions, um, your job will be pretty hard. So that's kind of the, the, the key hint I wanna give you. One, you need to change the packet formats. Two, you need to basically translate these protocols um, inside those functions using state transitions. Um, all right, ask me questions. Um, I have a question. I think it was in the previous video or maybe it was already in the GitHub assignment sheet. Um, mm -hmm. You mentioned that we needed to um, keep our client file separate for each um, protocol implementation. Um, did you mean just like copying uh, client up UI and just making one of them call RDT 2.1 and the other one 3.0 or yes that's what I would that's what I would recommend it's it's not like the most elegant way of doing this um, 
but I do I do recommend it for uh, one reason is that when you guys are done with 2.1 and it works, leave it alone. <laughs> leave it alone, submit it, get your points, and then start working <laughs> on, you, you know, well, not submit it yet, right? But like put it aside. Because what happened the first time I ran this assignment is people implemented 2.1, it worked great. They started working on 3.0, broke 2.1 by doing that. And then it was just like, nothing's working, you know? So that's why I said, let's just make sure 2.1 works and then move to 3.1 with like a fresh code base so you don't break what you had. Right? Um, and of course, Got you can it. handle it through your branches yeah. and stuff like that. But this is just a super simple sanity check for you to, yeah. Cool, thanks. Mm -hmm. All right, other, other questions? All right, going once, going twice. All right, great. Um, so um, next question, um, is there anything in like the RDT, TCP lectures that I went over that you want me to repeat? Are there any kind of fundamental questions about those things? Normally, I wouldn't go back so far, so far back, but since this is for the assignment and um, since we're kind of starting this new thing, I want to know that uh, you guys are okay with the kind of RDT TCP lectures thus far. Could you please go over um, the RDT 3.0 stop or the timeout bit? of the protocol? Sure. Uh, let me see. I might not have this slide for it. OK. Uh, I'm trying to share. All right. Um, all right. I'm gonna do this ugly thing because I don't have a. Usually, I don't go over this uh, in detail. Um, all right. So, okay. So basically, um, let's see. I can probably present make this a little bit bigger. Okay. Sort of good enough. Um, okay. So what happens is we are waiting for a a package to be. Um, to arrive from the application layer, right? So we're starting kind of the default starting point is here. Okay. So <clears throat> someone calls calls RDT send. Let me get my pointer. RDT send. We make a packet uh, with checksum, et cetera, et cetera. We send this packet and we start a timer. Okay. So now a timer is is going. So we are waiting for the acknowledgement. Now few things can happen, right? Um, the Acknowledgement, sorry, there's like a window here. I can move it around a little bit so I can see what I'm pointing at. Okay, great. So <clears throat> we get an RDT receive, okay, and the packet is corrupt, okay, or um, is acknowledgement for um, the other packet, right, the other sequence number. So we don't want that, okay? So basically, we're going to do nothing here. Um, we're going to wait for another acknowledgement, okay? Um, maybe this is a packet that got lost in the network. Maybe this is an acknowledgement that got corrupt. Um, maybe it's not a corrupt acknowledgement, but there's just bit got flipped. Who knows, right? We're still, we can't move on until we get an acknowledgement for the sequence number zero that we sent here. Okay. The other thing that can happen is a timeout, right? So we start a timer. Let's say we wait like two seconds, right? Um, and for your timer, you can set it to whatever you want, right? You don't have to do this like dynamic measurement of round trip time. Um, it's actually, I'm glad I get to go over this. You can just basically say the timeout is two seconds. It's static. It never changes. It's great. Totally good enough. Okay. So your timer goes off. Now, then you're basically going to resend the packet, the same packet that you made here, and start a new timer to see if it times out again. Okay. So, if you're getting bad packets, you keep waiting for X0. If you're getting a timeout because you didn't get an ACK, you resend the packet, which will hopefully generate another ACK. Um, and then once you do get a packet that is not corrupt and that is an acknowledgement, um, you can stop the timer and you can move on to waiting to get more data from um, 
uh, from the application layer. Thank you for clarifying, that really helps. Sure, great. Um, anything else that needs clarification? Will that just get stuck in a constant loop if it never receives an ACK packet? Yes, it will. Uh, yes. Because, uh, yes, so, okay. But yes, it will, and that is okay for now. Um, eventually what happens is that in a, in a TCP implementation, right? If there's um, basically no acknowledgement for uh, some amount of time, the socket will time out and it will start closing, right? So in this case, we'll keep resending the packet forever and ever and ever, um, but in a real TCP situation, eventually the socket will time out and close. Okay, perfect. Yeah, that was, uh, that was my question, if it just ended up closing or if it just sticks in the loop forever. Yep, yes, good question. Yeah, yeah, that's why we're we're implementing RDT, right? Which is like a TCP light, right? <laughs> or TCP without all the features. Um, because yeah, otherwise that would be much much harder. So. And so I know you learn all the important principles behind TCP without implementing, you know, lots and lots of corner cases. And so I know you uh, talked about how you kind of want to, for those timers, to set the timers, uh, you want to look at the round trip time and then yeah. kind of get it as close to that as possible. Um, of course, that also fluctuates. Um, for mm -hmm. this, uh, is there a recommended timing or timer on that, or are we gonna, is that part of our figuring it out then? Um, I would recommend a timer of, you know, one, around one second. Um, so if it's, if it's too short, your output is going to just go crazy, right? You're going to, it's going to be timing out all the time and it will be difficult for you to tell what is going on from the output. Um, if the timer is too long, you're going to be waiting for a long time to, to, you know, for the retransmission. So you can even play with it for different types of tests that you're doing as you, as you're implementing it. Um, you know, one second is probably a good a good amount of time. Okay, thanks. Yeah, but basically, whatever makes it easier for you guys to to, to debug your program. All right. Anything else? Good questions. Very good questions. All right, great. So, um, how do I get out of this? Perfect. All right, so let's start talking about um, more about TCP. Let me make it smaller because it's. Um, good enough. Okay. So, we'll talk about uh, TCP handshake, flow control, and congestion control, which are of the other mm, mechanisms that make TCP TCP and provide um, basically rate control um, and reliability um, over um, um, over end-to-end -end connections. Okay, so what you guys are seeing here is the very well-known diagram of uh, TCP state transitions. Right. So this is something that you guys can kind of be begin to read, right? If you probably looked at it first, you'd be like, what is this TCP thing and what does it do? But um, because you guys have seen state transition diagrams, you can at least kind of start chewing at it in some way, right? So let me show you some parts of it. Um, this is not something you need to memorize, by the way. So um, we start with a closed connection. The client is closed and the server is closed, okay? When you go, when you open a server connection, you go to the passive open, which goes to, to the listen state, right? And you guys have seen the listen function that basically tells the server to go into the listen state, okay? And on the server, on the client, you want to open a connection, okay? So you go to sending a, a SYN packet, and then there's some exchange that happens. I'll go over what happens here in detail, but eventually the client goes into an established connection and the server goes into the established connection. 
So the client and the server are kind of traversing different paths through this, but they all end up in this established connection eventually, and then they can start talking to each other. There's data exchange here, and then there's other things that can happen, um, kind of timing out and the closing connections from one or the other. Um, this doesn't really matter to us. It's somewhat um, complicated and it just handles a bunch of cases. Um, but the more interesting thing is that is the Synax. So how is this information carried, right? Because we have a complex protocol, we have a bunch of states, we need to kind of exchange information in a way that makes sense to the two ends of this communication. And so we have a TCP packet. Again, this is not something you guys need to memorize at all, but I want to show you what's in it because some of it ends up being used. So as in a UDP packet, right? We have a source port and a destination port, okay? Um, what else do we have? We have the sequence number, okay? Um, and we have the checksum, right? Those are kind of the, uh, and we have data, right? So those are kind of the similarities with the, with the UDP packet, right? But then there's also acknowledgements being sent. We kind of talked about how those are updated. Um, Right, and so you can have the sequence number of data that you're sending or the acknowledgement number of the data that you're sending. Okay, so I can be sending in the same packet my new data that I'm sending to you and also an acknowledgement of data that you sent to me. Right? So this is a kind of communication that goes back and forth and both the new data and acknowledgements can actually travel in the same packet together. Okay. Um, we have a header length, which is basically used to kind of figure out how, where the options end and where the data portion begins. Okay, we have some unused bits, which is pretty cool because if you're building like a custom implementation of TCP and you want to play with, oh, I'm going to start sending this bit of data, that bit of data to see if I can make TCP better, you have some space where you can play with that. You can also pass it in options, to be honest, but there are these bits that are unused. All right, and so all the routers are basically going to ignore those bits. They don't care what's in them. They're just going to pass them through. And then we have a bunch of different flags, such as this is an urgent packet. This is an acknowledgement packet. Um, this is a push. This is a reset connection. This is like closing. Uh, this is a syn packet. And this is fin, which is also used for closing. Okay? So um, these different flags are used to kind of differentiate between what packets are arriving here, kind of to mark all these packets differently. Okay. Um, we have a receive window, which we'll talk about in a second. Uh, we have internet checksum, and then we have an urgent data pointer, which goes along with urgent. I'll talk about that in a second. Okay. So there's a few extra things in this, in this TCP packet, but it is still pretty simple, um, but it can do quite a few, quite a few cool things. Okay. Um, so here's kind of the comparison of the differences between those packets. All right. So three-way handshake, how to establish TCP connection. And so with UDP, we can basically shoot off data and you don't even know if the receiver is there. With TCP, um, the sender and the receiver, the client and server will first establish a connection together and only then data will be sent. So you know your data is actually going somewhere. As part of this negotiation, they can also agree on some parameters um, about what the connection looks like. And also they can allocate resources. So um, this, these resources basically means buffers. So if data is going from A to B, B's operating system has allocated space to receive that data and hold it before the application layer is ready to process it. Okay, so here's how the connection starts. Um, the client will um, choose an initial sequence number, we'll call this um, X, and it will send a SYN packet. How does it Send a SYN packet? Well, it's just a normal TCP packet with the SYN bit set to one. Right? That's what makes the SYN packet. This, this bit is just set. Okay, so we have a SYN packet and initial sequence number. The server at this point will um, start allocating resources, okay, and it will pick its own sequence number Y, okay, and it will send the SYN ACK packet to say, yep, I got your SYN, I'm acknowledging it with an, with an ACK. Um, and so it, the SYN bit is set. The acknowledgement bit is also set. Okay. Um, the server sends its own sequence number and it has an acknowledgement number of X plus one, right? So we've got this packet and now it's acknowledging the sequence number plus one. Okay. So basically this got received, I'm waiting for 
um, something else. Right? Now, when the client receives this um, SYNAC, it can establish the connection. Okay? Um, and then it sends an ACK to the server, which just has the ACK bit. Okay? It says the ACK number to one plus one based on the server sequence number. And then um, it, um, when the server receives it, it can establish the connection. And now this is after the listen state. Okay? You have a connection on the client that you established. You have this connection, which uh, object which you received from calling accept on the server. And now you can use those connection objects to send data back and forth. Now you have both send and receive buffers on both the client and the server. All right, questions about this? So it's kind of one of those things that the server, the client, the client sends something and now the client doesn't know anything. Now, when the, when the server receives it, the server knows that the client opens the connection, okay? When the client receives this, the ACK, the SYNAC, the client knows that the server knows that the clients open the connection, okay? And here, now the server knows that the client knows that the server knows, et cetera, right? So now they both know that the connection has been established. Kind of like one of those, one of those things. Um, I have a question. Um, yep. What happens if um, the client establishes the connection, sends mm -hmm. the act to the server, but mm -hmm. the act gets lost, so the server never establishes the connection. Like, would the client yep. then be stuck with the established quote unquote connection while it's actually not established yet? That's a good question. Um, what do you guys think would happen? So the server, the client at this point thinks that um, the connection is established, right? It's it's happy. It's in the established state. Okay. Um, but this acknowledgement never gets to the server. All right. Um, what do you think the client will do from then on? I think the client would continue to send an acknowledgement packet until it established that connection. If the, if the acknowledgement packet never reached the server, that's what we're talking about? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, well, so essentially, client... it would just, it would just be trying to get back to the server if it, you know. That's that's one that's one way of thinking about it, but the client doesn't really know if this packet got lost at this point, right? Um, so no then it, from the server, would it try and send another SYN packet over to establish a new handshake? Not just yet, because at this point, the server, the client thinks that the connection has been established. Mm. Mm. Would the yeah. <clears throat> Oh, I was going to say, would the server have a timeout variable as well where it's waiting to receive? And if it doesn't hit that, get that acknowledgement, it would resend SYN uh, or the, um, its initial acknowledgement? Mm -hmm. That's one possibility as well. Um, here's what actually happens. The server will keep this connection open for a while and will wait for, it will wait for this acknowledgement to arrive. Okay, because the server doesn't know if it got lost, if it's delayed, right? The server will kind of say, okay, I'm waiting for this act. Uh, nothing's happening, so I'm just going to wait for it, right? The client thinks that the connection has been established. And when the client thinks the connection is established, it starts sending data, right? So it could start sending data. And then when it starts sending data, it sends both more of its data, right? By kind of sending more from the sequence uh, number X but it also keeps acknowledging the less data that it has received, which is Y plus one. Okay? So by sending more data, the server actually does get this acknowledgement eventually. Or what could happen if the server is down, and so the client thinks the connection is established, but the server doesn't, or the server timed out, the client will keep sending data and not get any acknowledgement, and eventually time out and kind of, you know, close the socket down, maybe try to reestablish it, or it will close the socket down and maybe the application layer would then try to reestablish the connection. Right. So this brings us to actually uh, an interesting um, security flaw of TCP, which is called, a, which enables the SYN attack. What happens in the SYN attack is 
a client or actually a lot of clients like a botnet will start sending a lot of SYN packets. Every time the server receives a SYN packet, it allocates a buffer to start receiving data from that client. So every time there's a SYN packet, the server kind of allocates more memory, more memory for the, the incoming connection. So if you send a, a gajillion SYN packets to a server, it will the server will try to allocate buffers for all those requests and eventually run out of memory. Right, so it's very easy to send a lot of SYN packets and then not follow up. Now you can say, okay, the server will time out and eventually, you know, it will reset these connections. But, you know, this timeout is whatever it is, right? But you can kind of send these SYNs so fast that it, you still kind of end up allocating a lot buffers a lot faster than they are reset by the timeouts. Right now, in practice, it's really easy to defend from the SYNs. You can see, oh, there's a lot of SYNs coming in, or you can say. Uh, well, these connections aren't really being followed up. I'm going to decrease my timeouts um, if on the server I'm running out of memory, right? But kind of in the early days of the internet, in the early days of botnets, SYN attacks were really annoying and difficult to deal with. So I hear that they basically, they've come up with like a more advanced attack where basically they just have, um, you know, hundreds or lots of different IP addresses all attacking at the same time. So it's a lot harder. Mm -hmm. Um, isolate and like block those connections. Is there okay. is there a good means of of defending against that, or is is that more along the lines of you just have to have like more protocols to sending or initiating this three way handshake? Um, so the three way handshake is not gonna. Um, you you basically need to deal with it by by monitoring the network and seeing that there's a lot more sins coming in now. Just because you're getting a SYN, you don't know if it's from a bot or if it's from um, a legitimate client trying to access your server and buy some stuff from you, right? Um, so SYNs are pretty difficult to, to, to deal with. Usually what happens is that um, if you're working with a good network provider, like at a business level, like um, you know level three or like a tier one provider, they will actually monitor the previous, um, these denial of distributed denial of service attacks and kind of have an idea of you know, when a certain traffic pattern matches a denial of service attack and they'll start proactively blocking that traffic. Um, but it is a cat and mouse game and organizations definitely do get, get uh, uh, you know, they get held up hostage for, um, for money basically to, to uh, when they're being DDoS. So I saw there were services like Cloudflare and stuff like that, where they would have like bot protections, where um, if you're on like an unsecured connection or anything like that, you actually have to go through the whole, you know, is this a truck, like to click on all these are the trucks in this picture and that kind of stuff. Yep. Um, is that is that not widely adopted just because people really hate having to answer those questions to get to your website, basically, or to whatever your service you were providing? Yeah, I mean... So it, it, de it depends on the website, right? Some services use that, but like if you try to get to CNN.com, like you're never gonna see something like that, right? The major providers basically pay CDNs a lot of, and ISPs a lot of money to just handle that, right? So that their users are not annoyed. Yeah. So basically filter out that traffic kind of proactively instead of making people go through a, through a capture. Gotcha. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and at least for me, like a lot of the time, if I if I would have to sign into one of those, I probably would visit that website less frequently. And for those mm -hmm. websites that need that constant traffic and rely on that constant traffic, like make money and uh, for the analytics, I think that that would just be defeating the purpose. So a lot of like uh, modern cybersecurity protocols actually will take into account, like we're talking about the sin attacks and the frequency of how fast SINs are coming in and uh, the IP addresses that SINs are coming from, if they're all similar IP addresses, uh, a little bit more difficult when you have, you know, X amount of zombies, but there's a lot that people do to prevent these kinds of attacks. Yeah, yeah, it's definitely a very interesting area. So if you go to work for an internet service provider or a content distribution network, um, I mean, they have whole teams dedicated basically to to solving this problem or similar type of distributed denial of service attacks. 
is there like a i'm assuming there's a way a means of like tracking individual ip addresses and stuff like that that seem to be that have committed sin attacks and and then potentially like following up and, and figuring out who these people are because i've definitely yes. heard of people getting caught doing that but yes and it's uh i mean it's a pretty cool area. So when I was doing my PhD in Santa Barbara, we had a we had a a very good we still have a very good security group there. And what they were working on at the time was basically um, capturing these botnets. So they would set up these um, these honeypot computers and basically try to get that that honeypot captured as a bot. And then from there they would try to reverse engineering reverse engineer it. And uh, one of my good friends there uh, managed to capture to capture a botnet. And then as he was getting close to it. Uh, the lab actually contacted FBI and was just like, hey, we're doing this for research. We're taking over this botnet. We're going to shut it down. <laughs> like, Don't come to us. We're not actually running it. We're stealing it and shutting it down. So, That's hilarious. Yeah. Yeah. That was definitely like a lot of FBI negotiation because they needed to basically get an OK before they did that. Mm-hmm. Otherwise, you know, they would be potentially liable for whatever the botnet did while they kind of you know, had some control over it. So, yeah. All right. All right. Let's move on. <laughs> Good question, guys. Um, so, uh, the next mechanism I want to talk about is uh, flow control, which basically allows the receiver to throttle the sender. Um, right? And you can think of a simple analogy when, if you're having a conversation with somebody and they're speaking too quickly, you can say, wait, hold on, hold on, hold on, right? You kind of give them a feedback to stop sending you so much information. And this is basically what the receiver does. So the, um, the receiving endpoint of a socket, right? This could be client on the server. Now we're just talking about the receiver of whoever's sending data, right? Because the flows go back and forth. Um, allocate some amount of data to, to receive the incoming, some buffer space to receive the incoming data. Okay? So we have the receive buffer. And as data is coming in, as payments are coming in from the, uh, from the network layer, okay, they are being buffered until the application layer kind of siphons them off. Right? So if the application layer is siphoning them slowly or more slowly than the rate at which they're arriving, this buffered data will basically start filling up the free buffer space okay? and reducing this receiver window value. Now, this receiver window okay, gets sent here. So whenever I'm sending an acknowledgement, I'm also telling the sender how much space I have left in the receiver window. Okay? And as, as this starts getting closer and closer to zero, right, the sender can start sending me less and less data, or if this reaches zero, they can basically stop sending me data. Right? Or basically, if you know, there's space here for 10 packets, and I can, you know, in my sender window, I can send basically 20 packets at a time, um, I'm going to just reduce the number of packets I'm sending in a pipeline, right? Just to not oversend what um, what the receiver can can process or has space to to store. Okay, so that's the the, the receive receive window, um, and so you can. Um, I remember I mentioned. Sorry, I'll back up one more time. I mentioned that there are these options that you can send in a packet. So when you're opening a socket, you can actually control a lot of the options, and one of them. Um, is, for example, you can request for the receiver buffer to, to have a certain size, right? So you can request that the, that the receiving end allocates as much space. Now, they don't have to do it, but you can request it, right? Um, operating systems can also auto-adjust it. So if it's filling up on one particular connection, they can allocate more buffer space. Um, this kind of depends on the implementation of, of TCP you have in your operating system. Um, okay, and but there's an interesting question of, what happens when this receiver window gets set to zero, right? So I sent so much data that this buffer has filled up and now I can't send any more data. So if I can't send any more data, I'm not gonna get any more acknowledgements. And if I don't get any more acknowledgements, I don't actually get any notification that the receiver window has increased and there's more space to send data into, (laughs) right? So I end up in like a chicken on an egg problem. So the solution to this is even after a receiver window kind of fills up and I get told that please send no more data, the sender will keep sending like one bytes of data just so they can get an acknowledgement um, telling the sender that the receiver window has now freed up and you can send at a higher rate. 
All right. Another interesting thing that you guys may not know about is this thing called Nagel's algorithm. Um, and it basically controls how much data does the transport layer need to get to actually form a packet, right? So let's say that, um, let's say that the transport layer is like super aggressive about sending data, okay? So you start sending data into your socket, but you're basically like trickling it in. And the transport layer is so aggressive that whenever something shows up, it just it grabs that first byte and forms a packet, okay? So the problem with that is that now you're sending one bytes of data and you have all this packet overhead um, that you're including, right? Because you need to include the source, the source port, the destination port, all these other flags, right? Just to send one byte of data. Okay, so we definitely don't want to do that, right? That's poor network utilization, mostly what we're sending is packet headers. So instead we can wait a long time. Basically we get data from the application layer and the transport layer looks at it and says, mm -mm, not enough, not enough, I need more, right? And so it waits for a long time before it actually sends something. Um, so then it's sending a lot of data in any given packet. There's lower kind of percentage of overhead from the headers, but now there's a, this big delay in sending anything. Okay. So basically this is what um, Nagel's algorithm does, is it, it waits a little bit um, to see if there's data to be sent. And if there is, then it's going to form a packet. If there isn't, it's going to kind of queue it and wait for more data to arrive from the application layer. So, um, combined with delayed acknowledgement from, from the receiver, right? We often can wait for two packets to arrive before we send an acknowledgement. Um, these two can interact kind of poorly when there's just not that much data to send. So if you're running something, if you're running a, a network game on your computer, you may want to get into the settings and actually turn this off. There's a kind of a Windows option you can do to, to, to turn it off. Um, and then your kind of position updates are going to be sent much more quickly. You're not going to wait for like a bunch of position updates before sending any of them. Um, and this is something that's already disabled by default on an Xbox or, um, well, Xbox, I know for sure, I'm assuming PlayStation 2, et cetera, et cetera. Right? So um, just like a little trick, you can get to boost your PC, uh, your TCP performance specifically for gaming on PCs. All right, there's two other flags I wanna go over quickly and I think that's what's gonna kind of, that's what we're gonna leave off today. So I mentioned that there are these push, push and urgent flags. Um, so push is used to basically make sure that the packet goes out right away. So if you pass one byte of data to the transport layer, but you do want that data to go out right away, you know, that's like the only byte you're sending, doesn't need to wait for anything else, it just needs to go you can set um, the push flag um, to, um, to on your packet, and then it's gonna kind of go out, um, go out, out of the sender buffer immediately. Okay. The other thing you can do is set an urgent flag um, where basically some bytes arrive into this buffer, into the receiver buffer, but if, they're in, if there's an urgent flag associated with them, they're actually going to go to the front of the buffer of the data that needs to be sent to the to the application layer from uh, TCP. Okay, so I mentioned that TCP delivers data in order, and that's true unless you set the urgent flag, in which case it's going to get kind of pushed to to the front. Right, um, and the offset is kind of controlled also in um, sorry the urge. Um, there's an urgent data point which controls the offset into the data portion of the packet to kind of move that data um, up to, to, the track, to the application layer, okay? These are pretty much never used in practice. You either have Nagels turned on or off. Um, an urgent flag is actually kind of difficult to use because your application layer actually does rely on things arriving in order. So unless you have like an application that can handle bits or bytes coming in out of order, um, this can be pretty disruptive, um, but it can be used for like interactive protocols. If, for example, um, you know, you're sending small amounts of data and you want to reorder some of them, um, that's something you can actually do. But then you kind of need to maintain your own receive buffer at the application layer to be able to scan bytes in it to kind of pull out the data that has been served urgently instead of just parsing everything like it should be arriving in order, if that makes sense. So just so you kind of, I kept getting questions of what these flags do and I can tell you they do this. 
even though they're very rarely used in practice. All right, I think we can end here. I'm going to just get us into congestion in the next lecture. Um, so, any final questions today? Just a quick question on the urgent. I know this isn't really all going to probably be all that relevant, but um, if a lot of these messages are urgent, is there like an order of precedence just based on when they're received at that point? Or <laughs> uh, <laughs> that's a good question. I don't know that. I don't know if like whatever um, gets received urgent last goes to the front automatically. Um, yeah, I'm not sure. It's a good question. Yeah, I was just curious. I mean, I to, yeah, no, I have to, I have to dig through like uh, the TCP implementation to see what happens, um, or the RFC for um, uh, for TCP, which is also kind of a monster. <laughs> Yeah, and not that I think that would ever be relevant. I mean, that would be kind of chaos if you're just like if you everything. Figure this out. <laughs> if you figure this out based on documentation, I will give you an extra uh, point on your homework. <laughs> you're so inclined. Okay, sounds good. Um, all right. Um, well, thank you guys. Um, we'll go on with congestion control on um, Wednesday, and. Um, I would like to see a lot of you in my office hours on Wednesday as well to talk about these projects, unless you guys are feeling um, good about it. Shoot me emails. Um, I'll, I'll, um, I'll, I'll work to be more responsive than I have been. And uh, I want to make sure you guys are having a, a hard time, but a good time with these assignments. So, all right. Thank you all. Thanks again. Thanks. Also, I do want to say, I appreciate the live class today. So thanks again for that. That was really nice to be able to chat and ask questions. Great. So, Thank yeah, you. I thanks. appreciate I appreciate you letting me know that. Yep, yeah, absolutely. All right. Take care. Thanks. Bye. Hey uh Dr. Woody, I have yeah. a quick question about the programming assignment. If if you have a minute, um otherwise no worries. Sure. Let me just stop my recording to make sure uh, this gets done correctly. No worries.